It's good to be here again this morning, and I have to admit right off the bat, I got confused as I walked up here. Because I looked over at the board and I said, it's way too hot to be January the 8th, 2012. So Nat, that's fine, you fix it later. I just got a little confused up here when I looked up. I knew knew it was July because it was kind of warm out, but uh, uh, I got like five days notice, Jim, just so you know. Luckily, Nora was up here in the middle of the week and Dad told her that he was wanting me to speak today. So I did have five days notice, and if Dad hasn't told you by now, he will. If you're going to stand up and share the Word of God, you always got to be prepared. So, um, and and when Nora told me that I was going to speak, I said, well, there's a couple things the Lord's been walking me through over the last few months. So I figured the Lord's going to use one of them to share today. And uh, one of the things He's been walking me through is what does it mean to be in a, walking in a true obedience to God? And that's kind of broad. Because when you start reading the Bible and studying the Bible, you learn that every day you're going to learn something new about walking in obedience Amen. to God. Well, a few weeks ago, um, I don't know, y'all may have done this before. I was sitting around, I was wanting to read my Bible, and I just grabbed it and started flipping through it. I'd read two or three verses, and I'd be like, nah, that ain't it. I'd flip a little more, and I'd read, and it just wasn't clicking. And finally, I sat back, and I said, Lord, show me what you want me to read. And I'd like to say the next flip of the Bible, I went right to what I went to. But it was three or four more flips, and I turned right to the book of James. So if you've got your Bible, turn to the book of James with me. But I turned to the book of James, and I started in the first verse, and it really clicked with me. And I read through the whole book, and I went back, and I've reread the book of James four or five times over the last three or four weeks. And one of the things I've learned is through a lot of the New Testament, there is a very profound biblical doctrine that we are being justified by faith. You read through all the books that Paul writes, and Paul tells us that we are justified by faith. But the book of James gives us another very important truth about our Christian walk. And James teaches us that another area of our faith is by our good works. We will be known by our good works. It ain't just a matter of our faith, but but what flows out of us is going to show what a genuine believer really is. The book of James offers a very good practical advice to us as everyday Christians, as living a Christian life today. James teaches us in the first, just look at the first 11 verses here. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass. And the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. The first thing we see in verse 1 is James is one of us. He starts his letter, if you read some of the books that Paul writes, Paul always starts his letter with, Greeting I the Apostle Paul. Paul's telling you that he was anointed and set up by Jesus Christ to do something. But James says, I am a servant of God. (coughs) And that's what we are. We are just servants of God. He's telling us that we are just like him. Next, in verse 2, James makes a statement that quite honestly has puzzled me ever since I read it. And he says in verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, who of us here is going to be joyful and happy when we have diverse temptations or trouble in our life? How many of us, if we go to the doctor and get a a bad report, is going to go out of there all giddy and happy? But you see, the verse tells us, count it all joy when you have troubles. But you see, something I just learned, that verse always troubled me because I thought I was telling God. I said, God, I can't be happy when times are tough and times are hard. But you see, just last week, actually, and I've been studying this for a week and a half, a month and a half, I heard another pastor explain it. Count it all joy or consider it comes from the Greek word that means move forward. 
fast forward. What the writer is telling us here is that we're not to dwell on the situation we're in. We're not to have a pity party when things are going bad. Amen. We're not to look Come forward. On, Jesus. We're to look the past Lord. the situation. See, now, as a Christian, as a believer, if we look past the situation, what's the ultimate reward? It's heaven. So what do we got to worry about when we get a bad report or things aren't going the way we want? We just keep our eye on the prize. Amen. And the prize is the ultimate goal is to serve God in heaven. It goes on to verse 3 and it says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James explains to us that also when we face these trials, that is for a reason. It just isn't just to mess with you. There is a reason for the trials and troubles you're facing. That it worketh patience. Now, who can always use more patience? Amen. 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 It, and it even says it builds patience. So it's building on top of what you already have. You can't have enough patience. It's telling you it's going to build and keep building patience. So why do we face these situations in our lives? In verse 4 it tells us that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I think all of us can say we want to be perfect and we don't want to have to worry about nothing. But we all know too as believers that the only time we're going to see that is when we're with God in heaven. Amen. And that's what the writer is telling us. Not to dwell on where you're at now, but to move forward. Think about the prize that's waiting on you at the end. That's the Lord. Come on. The next point James makes is in verse 5 through 8. And he says, If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James is telling us here that if we lack wisdom, we are to ask God. Amen. But we are to ask in faith, not wavering. Lord. How many of us have went to God for wisdom when we don't understand why something is happening? Mm -hmm. But we go to God with a weak-minded attitude mm -hmm. instead of being full of faith that God's going to give us what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. James tells us if we go weak, we are like a wave on the sea driven with the wind and tossed and that we shouldn't even think that God's going to give us what we're asking for. James is telling us if you're going to go weak, don't even waste your time going. If you don't have faith that God's going to give you the wisdom you're asking for, why even ask for it? That's the Lord. But that's how we do. We have pity parties. We forget that we're serving the Almighty God, the Creator of everything. That's the Lord. And if we truly keep that on our mind, that God is the Almighty, why should we go with anything less than faith that He's going to answer? Because if we go without faith, then we don't even believe God's going to answer it anyway. And that's what James is telling us here. He tells us as we grow in our personal relationships with God, our faith is going to grow also. Mm -hmm. It tells us many times through the Bible to grow your faith. You have to believe and you have to trust. You have to read God's words. You have to pray to God and tell Him to show you and to grow you and teach you. Thank you. The final point of the three points James is making is as believers that we find ourselves in humble or humiliating financial circumstances and we can always put our confidence in the high standing we have with God. In verse 9 it says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Mm -hmm. You could be poor, homeless, but if you're serving God, lift yourself up. Have the confidence to know that you serve the Almighty God. Mm -hmm. You may have Lord. nothing, but if you got God, you have everything. Amen. Amen. And it also says, if you are wealthy, you need to remember how quick you can lose your wealth. Amen. And you need to put your confidence in your relationship with God. In verse 10 and 11 he says, But the rich, and that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. The rich man can lose that wealth just as quick as he gained it. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower thereof falleth. And the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. So the, the three themes or the three ideas that James is teaching us on here is how do we encounter trials and tribulations and how are we to handle them? Wisdom. When we lack wisdom, ask God. Don't go trying to find it on your own because you're going to find lies if you find it on your own. And how are we to handle poverty and wealth? Now if you go through the rest of the book of James and the rest of verse 1, he repeats the three themes. He tells us again a little more detail 
of the three things. If you look at verse 12 of chapter 1, he says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Lord. So he's telling us right there, he goes back to the second verse where he says, says, count it all joy when you're in these trials and tribulations. He says down here in verse 12, because if you move forward, move past the situation, the crown of life is what's waiting on you. Amen. And keep your focus on the prize, the crown of life. One of the other, if you go to verse 19, it's one of my favorite verses. And it goes back to the wisdom. He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. He's telling us here that we ask for this wisdom. When God gives it to you, share it. Don't just sit there and be hearers of the word, but be doers. He's telling us that our faith will flow out of us and show people that we are true believers. We have a lot of people today, and we were talking about it earlier. You profess Christianity, but God's not number one in your life. Well, if God's not number one, he might as well be last. Amen. Because God will not be second place to nothing or nobody. And I think James is teaching us here a very valuable lesson that as believers we must adapt it to our everyday lives and walk letting what flows out of us be good and be just. I've heard Dad say a hundred times, the fruit will be known by the, the tree will be known by the fruit it bears. If you profess Christianity, I don't care how many times you profess it, people's going to know if you're a true Christian or not. They're going to know by your actions and the way you carry yourself. If you see a person who's professing Christianity coming out of a bar, now what do you believe? Lord. As a Christian, we are Christ-like, and that's how we're supposed to act. Amen. One of the last points he makes is about wealth and about poverty and how we're supposed to handle ourselves. He tells us, if you're wealthy, what are you supposed to do with your money? In verse 27, he says, To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We're supposed to help widows and orphans. I've read that so many times over the past three or four months. How many times God tells us as believers to take care of widows and orphans. And we fail today. Amen. We fail in how we're taking care of the people that we need to take care of Amen. as Christians. The rest of chapter of the book of James, chapters 2 through 5, he goes into more detail explaining uh, on how these three themes are to work out in your life and how you're to work them. Well, the funny thing is, I was going to go through this whole book. But the other day as I was praying, God gave me the beginning of my message, and he gave me the end of my message, and I went, Lord, how are you going to fill this gap? Because the beginning of my message was James, and the last of it was about love. And what did we talk about this morning? We were talking about love. And when God laid the beginning, we were, me and Lisa was driving, well, we were driving to Hendersonville Friday before we came up here to see Christian. We was listening to a preacher on the radio, and he mentioned one verse, and I went, all right, Lord, I got it. I know what you wanted. But here's a question. Take all this that James is teaching us about the way we act, the way we are, what flows out of us, shows our true faith, shows who we are as believers. Here's a question I have that came to me as I was writing this down. If everything that I've just talked about, let's say that I am good at not getting upset when things aren't going my way, yet I shut out to a point the people around me and handle it all by myself and I don't share it with them. I am good at asking for wisdom from God, but instead of sharing it in love, I arrogantly state it that God said this or that. Is that love? What if I am good at helping widows and orphans with my money, yet I don't want any face-to-face -face time with them? I don't want to show them any love. If I do all these good things, but I don't show love, are the things that flow out of me works of genuine faith? I don't believe so. Because if you turn to John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the Lord. Now, he didn't say, pick the ones you want to choose. He didn't say, oh, I'll make a top ten list of my commandments and follow them, or hey, find one that you can do and do it. He said, keep my commandments. He's saying, keep all 
my commandments. If we truly show love, we're going to keep all his commandments. The other verse, turn to John 13, 34, 35. And Jesus is telling the disciples, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. But this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Lord. We can do everything in the Bible that it says to do, but if we don't do it with love, it's futile. It's a waste of time. You can be the good person, the good Christian, but if you're not doing it in love, it doesn't matter. Jesus tells us the most important thing he ever gave us was love. God loved us so much he gave his only son that we could be free. Everything we do is out of love. Now, I know how James likes stories. So I'm going to wrap up with a story. See, I didn't even go long today. Like I got accused of once before. But James likes stories. So I'm going to close with a story that James I know will like. And James, you can share this one sometime if you want to. And the story is about this preacher. And this preacher was preaching on love. And specifically, he was preaching on husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And this preacher come down, and he went to this one guy, and he goes, James, you love your wife? And he said, yeah, preacher, I love my wife. He said, well, James, do you tell her you love her? He said, well, I tell her I love her almost every day. He said, James, you need to tell her you love her every day and watch the change that happens in your life. So he moves over to this other guy and goes, Brother Bob, you love your wife? He said, yeah, preacher, I love my wife. He said, well, do you tell her you love her? He said, preacher, every time she does something good, I tell her I love her. He said, Brother Bob... If you'll tell her you love her every day, she'll do more good things. Well, then the pastor moves up to the front row where there's this elderly man. He said, Brother Wayne, Brother Wayne, do you love your wife? He said, Preacher, yes, I love my wife. He said, well, Brother Wayne, do you tell her you love her? He said, Preacher, 45 years ago when I married her, I told her I loved her. And I told her then, if anything changed, she'd be the first to know. <laughs> I've heard that story, and I thought about it. And as funny as it is, I got to thinking, how many of us treat our relationship with God just like one of those stories? Yeah. We don't tell God every day we love Him. Amen. Lord. We wait till God does something good in our lives, and then we go, oh, God, I love you, and I thank you, and I praise you. Or some of us haven't told God we loved Him since the day we accept Him as our Savior. Mm. My challenge is every day, start every day praising God. Start every day just saying, God, I love you. And I look forward to what you have for me today. And I swear and I promise to you, that you're going to see mighty change in your life if you'll just put God first and tell Him you love Him. Amen. Brother James. Thank you.